Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. So since it is now 4 p.m. Eastern time, we will be getting started. So again, welcome everyone to the June 2021 COVID Information Commons Research Webinar. My name is Helen Yang. I'm a student at Columbia University and a member of the COVID Information Commons project team. So the COVID Information Commons or KIC is a COVID-19 research collaboration platform brought to you by the four big data innovation hubs and funded by the National Science Foundation Convergence Accelerator. And the COVID Information Commons or KIC um, we bring together researchers every month as part of this webinar series to give lightning talks to share their research findings and engage in community discussion and Q&A. So before we get into our wonderful list of speakers today, I'd like to introduce co-PI on the KIC project and executive director of the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub, Florence Hudson, to tell us a bit more about the KIC. Thank you so much, Helen, and thank you for organizing this entire thing. I have to let you know that Helen is a student on the team, as she mentioned. She's been with us for over a year, and she organized this entire event. So I want to thank you for all this great work. And for the other students on the, on the line, too, Abhishek and Paula, who are helping us out. So the COVID Information Commons was funded in May of 2020 through a rapid award from the NSF Convergence Accelerator, as Helen mentioned. We launched in July of 2020, and initially we weren't sure how popular it was going to be. We actually had 178 people attend our kickoff meeting, which was rather shocking to us. Um, and we had over 40 PIs offer to present their research. So in that first webinar, we told everyone, congratulations, you're now part of the COVID Information Commons community. And we created these monthly webinars. And we're really delighted that while we started with NSF awards, uh, the RAPID awards, which are RAPID Research Response Grants, we added other NSF awards. We also now include our NIH colleagues. So NIH funded uh, COVID researchers. And we're really delighted that we have one joining us today. So the COVID Information Commons has multiple search tools. So you can look at the NSF awards. We're looking to add the NIH awards in the future, as well as meet the researchers. So all the research lightning talks will be on there. We have 55 on there so far, and we have more researchers today. There are also uh, groups and guides and over 50 data sets from around the world related to COVID. So please feel free to share this with everybody. It's open access, which is the whole idea um, from the FAIR principle findable, accessible, um, interoperable, and reusable. And we're delighted you could all join us today. So Helen, take it away and introduce our great speakers, please. Thank you so much, Florence. So here's our list of speakers for today. Dr. Katie Corby from Auburn University, Dr. Luis Ortiz from the New School, Dr. Jeffrey Townsend from Yale University, Dr. Gongli Wang and Jonathan Paddleford from Georgia State University, Dr. Hai Chong Kai Zhang from Worcester Polytechnic Institute, and Dr. Caroline Weiss from Yale University. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Katie Corby from Auburn University. So Katie, feel free to share your screen. Uh -huh. All right, um, so I'm Katie Corby. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at Auburn University. Um, and we are working on a study to look at how policymakers in the South consumed and acted on scientific information um, over the past year in the context of COVID-19. And so the PI on the project is Dr. Kelly Dunning of the Auburn School of Forestry and Wildlife. Um, and we've also been working with Dr. Williamson, Willoughby and Zadi at Auburn and also Dr. Parrish Bergquist from Georgetown. Mark. Hold on. There we go. <laughs> All right. Um, and so to frame our study, um, we have been using the policy regime framework. Um, it is um, from the uh, public administration literature, and it seeks to explain um, and identify the different things that are in play whenever there is a policy regime. In this case, it would be the response to COVID-19. And so um, this slide kind of outlines work that was um, done by two scholars in the field, Carter and May, and this was published last year. Um, and this framework, um, they kind of did an initial assessment of COVID-19 and then we're building on it by um, looking at what the response has been in Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. And so this framework theor theorizes that poli policy responses to major issues such as the pandemic include ideas, institutions, and interests. And ideas are the concepts that become the foundations uh, for policy. So in our case, we're defining the science of COVID as our ideas. 
um, as these are the basis for guidance, um, mandates, et cetera, in the response to COVID. And then we have institutions. And so these are the federal, state, local agencies and organizations um, that have responded to COVID. Um, we're particularly interested in what their actions have been. And we are looking at both their individual actions and um, collaborative actions. And then finally, you have interests, which are uh, the different political actors who push for different um, policy approaches um, during the response. And so um, the second box of each of these three kind of shaded areas um, kind of outlines the findings of Carter and May. And as we kind of go through the next few slides, you will see that we are finding um, very similar things. So we have uh, three components, three major components to our study. The first is an analysis, analysis of policy documents. Uh, the second is interviews with decision makers. And the third is a public survey. And so for the policy document analysis component of the study, we've been uh, collecting policy documents from federal, state, local agencies, other organizations um, who have played some role in the COVID response uh, for our three states. And so these documents um, can include official agency guidance, general website content, news releases, um, press conference, write-ups, um, any kind of other information that is out there that can help us to understand um, what ideas have been communicated, who has been doing it, what have been the roles of the different institutions involved, um, and what are the various interest groups that have influenced the response in the three states. Um, and so we're kind of in the early stages of this. Um, for ideas, we found that generally information has flowed from federal agencies down to state agencies, and then on to local agencies uh, and organizations. And that states have, in general, developed plans from federal guidance. Um, they are incorporating CDC data, but also their own state level data. And then these plans are operationalized um, at both the state and local level. For institutions um, to date, we've found that um, there was a reduced response capacity at the federal level, and that this caused a lot of confusion and delay in response. Um, and it has led state and local actors to really take responsibility um, for creating and operationalizing uh, their policy responses um, for COVID. And uh, for the interests, um, sure it's no surprise that political uh, polarization has just really hampered uh, the response. And so we are picking up on that as well. And the second component um, is interviews with decision makers. And so um, these are also federal, state and local um, organizations. And so I'm talking with um, different state and local health departments, governmental offices, uh, governor's offices, mayor's offices, um, local um, uh, organizations like educational institutions, community organizations, hospital systems, chambers of commerce, media representatives, et cetera. Um, so we're trying to get a fairly broad uh, representation there. And so in general, we found again that uh, the information has flowed from the federal level, but many of the local organizations in particular are pr primarily relying on state level um, data to develop their policy responses um, as they just feel that it's more appropriate um, for what they're trying trying to get done. Um, agencies are sharing scientific information, so virus characteristics, risk, uh, different behaviors that people can engage in to try to slow the spread, but they're also sharing resources such as um, links to unemployment information, uh, small business loan information, Etc. And they are doing it by every medium that you could imagine. Um, and so general, in general, uh, in terms of trust, that's come up a lot in the interviews. Um, and there's been a real focus on building uh, trust at the local level and also capitalizing on trust that is already there at that level um, to really kind of operationalize and facilitate the policy res um, responses that are coming um, from all levels of government, really. Um, and so uh, we're also asking them about their challenges. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that has been talked about by so many of our participants um, is the inability to effectively counter misinformation um, for many reasons, just because it spreads so rapidly. There's a huge volume of misinformation. 
the politicization of the entire response um, and also the promotion of misinformation at the federal level, uh, particularly in the early stages of the pandemic last year. Um, another big thing they're mentioning is uh, information management, again, just because of the sheer volume of the information that's coming out, um, that the information has changed over time, just as the response um, and situation has changed. And also just this sense of burnout in the population um, in terms of how much uh, information about COVID we're expecting people to uh, consume, internalize, and act upon. And then in general, um, just this widely held belief that COVID has highlighted existing societal issues, uh, racism, politic uh, politicization, disparities in health, education, income, access to resources, um, and that those are the things that we really need to focus on in order to better deal with um, situations like this in the future. And then the final component of the survey is a public, or of the study, sorry, is a public survey, which we'll be rolling out in the next few weeks to adult residents of Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. And so we'll be asking them where they're asking people where they're accessing information about COVID um, from all levels of sources, federal, state, and local. So we've included major news outlets, local outlets, mayor's offices, local radio and TV um, agencies like CDC or the state or local health department, social media individuals, such as uh, including former President Trump and President Biden, people's personal physicians, religious leaders, families and friends, employers, et cetera. Uh, the crux of the survey um, are experimental questions that we're going to use to examine public trust and information that's provided by different levels of government. Um, and so we'll have messages such as guidance on COVID mitigating uh, behaviors that people can engage in, and we will attribute those messages to various institutional actors from the different levels of government, and then we'll gauge participant response um, to that presentation of the information. Um, so we're kind of excited about that. Um, and then we'll also um, ask about support or opposition to various mitigation me measures, as well as any personal behaviors that people have or have not engaged in to control the spread of COVID. Uh, and then of course, we will be uh, collecting demographic information so that we can analyze uh, our responses by the different subgroups of respondents. So that's a very quick <laughs> um, overview of what we're doing. I have to acknowledge all of the students who have helped us uh, so far with this project. Um, and these are the references for the policy regime framework if anybody is interested in that. Thank you, Dr. Corby. And you know we're looking forward to the results of your survey. And so please add any questions you have for Dr. Corby and any of the other researchers into the Zoom chat and um, they'll be able to respond to them. And we'll also have an extended Q&A session at the end. Great, so next up, I'd like to welcome Dr. Luis Ortiz from the New School. Thank you, Helen. Let me... There you go. All right, super. Uh, so thanks for having me, everyone. Um, so I, uh, Helen said, I'm Luis Ortiz, a postdoc fellow. Uh, at the Urban Systems Lab at the New School, uh, where uh, I'm a co-PI along with Ahmed Mustafa and Tyler McPherson uh, on an NSF rapid project to study overlapping hazards uh, uh, or, or weather and COVID-19 hazards in New York City, uh, as well as uh, access, different access to, to uh, uh, adaptation measures and, uh, and social vulnerability uh, across the city. So uh, New York City, uh, as a function of its uh, extremely high population for, for US standards and, and where it sits geographically, it's subject to a variety of uh, weather related hazards. Uh, these range from heat waves, thunderstorms, uh, coastal and uh, uh, sort of a uh, riverine flooding. Um, and these hazards can, can occur separately, but they also often occur uh, you know, in either temporal or spatial overlaps. Um, and quick examples of those include uh, 
when we have a heat wave that is either followed or, or preceded by, by a large thunderstorm, uh, or when we have extreme heat and, and uh, high air quality uh, issues uh, in different parts of the city. Um, and uh, there, there's a growing body of work that has found that uh, these hazards are not evenly distributed um, and the, their impacts are, are, are felt, uh, or there's large inequities in the impacts felt by these uh, different types of hazards. Uh, now, um, enter 2020, uh, and, and, and COVID-19 has sort of uh, thrown or complicated uh, uh, some, of, some of these dynamics by introducing uh, yet another hazard uh, into the fray, so to speak, um, uh, with also recent work showing that uh, in the city, but also broadly across the United States, uh, there's uh, sort of uneven impacts uh, in terms of exposure and mortality rates uh, of COVID-19. Um, and, and, and these concurrent uh, hazards uh, complicate the way we respond to them. Uh, for me, the, the sort of the classic example being uh, here in New York City, we have cooling centers uh, for certain days of the, of, of the summer months uh, where it gets too hot, uh, which uh, are, are most effective when they can serve a, a large uh, population. Uh, however, COVID-19 sort of throws a wrench uh, in that uh, uh, by uh, sort of limiting uh, how many people can be in any one place safely. Uh, so so the, the aim of this work is uh, to look at these sort of overlapping hazards um, and, and sort of generate maps of where uh, there are hot spots or, or, or cool spots of, of these overlaps in New York City and how those relate to uh, uh, existing uh, social economic vulnerabilities. So, to, to do that, um, we took uh, zip code level data from the New York City Department of Health uh, of uh, the, the positive uh, or the positivity rates in New York City uh, at the height, excuse me, of the, of the of, uh, 2020 summer peak. Um, and that's what you see here on that panel or that figure on the left, um, where you see some, some um, uh, uh, sort of hot spots in, 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 in or, or locations with higher uh, or significantly higher uh, COVID rates uh, than, than others, uh, especially in South Bronx, parts of Queens and Brooklyn, uh, with low spots being uh, over uh, Midtown, Upper West Side, Manhattan, uh, as examples. Uh, and then what we did is uh, we, to, to sort of get a, a measure of the, of the weather hazard, in this case, heat, um, we ran uh, a high resolution regional climate model over the city using uh, sort of the state of the art urbanized weather model uh, uh, in the, uh, for, for the city itself. Uh, and to do that, we uh, leveraged the wealth of civic uh, public information in, in the city, including building area heights uh, and all manner of, uh, of geometric features of the city that we then feed into this uh, regional climate model to sort of reproduce the weather of uh, summer 2020, uh, which uh, you see here in, in, in those figures on the right uh, compared to different locations, uh, the FK Airport, uh, NYC, which is a Central Park uh, weather station. Uh, on, on the very lower bottom uh, right, uh, you see the average daily maximum temperatures, which is what we use as our measure of extreme heat in, in the city. Uh, and you can sort of tell uh, just from that qualitatively that there are uh, certainly uh, sort of geospatial variations uh, as you go to different parts of the city uh, related to how we build our city, but also related where, where you are in relation to distance to the coast because of the sea breeze and stuff like that. Uh, now, in terms of social vulnerability, uh, we leveraged uh, essentially a subset of what the CDC calls the social vulnerability indicators um, based on the American Community Survey 2018 five-year estimates, uh, which we then re-aggregated to the, the same zip code level uh, boundaries that uh, you saw earlier in the COVID data. Um, and, and I say a subset because we essentially uh, eliminated some of the indices that were not relevant for New York City uh, after some uh, collinearity tests. Uh, for example, stuff that we removed was uh, percentage of people in mobile homes, which is not a, a significant number uh, in New York City. Uh, and we, essentially we develop a, a vulnerability index based on, on, on these indicators that are listed here. 
Um, so you can see in, in, in that figure, uh, areas of high uh, vulnerability versus low vulnerability. And, and this map is, is, is very similar to, to similar efforts uh, for using different types of vulnerability studies in New York City. Um, finally, what we did was uh, compute a, a sort of multi-hazard risk index. Now that we're uh, essentially combining uh, or creating our own hazard index, combining the COVID and the daily maximum temperatures that we simulated uh, with this social socioeconomic vulnerability index that I uh, just showed you, uh, to sort of highlight where are the hotspots um, of, uh, of both heat and, and, and COVID-19 uh, in the context of that social vulnerability. Uh, and, and, and you see that right here in this map on the right uh, with the areas marked in red as being uh, on the sort of a, a upper end and blue being on the lower end. Uh, and you see uh, uh, on the areas of high uh, sort of a combined risk being the South Bronx, upper Manhattan, uh, where you essentially have very high combination of or, or, or combination of high um, social vulnerability indicators such as low income or high proportions of uh, people of color, uh, as well as very high afternoon temperatures and COVID-19 incidents. Uh, now these might essentially be related in, in many ways as some recent work has shown that uh, temperatures are often related to um, uh, redlining maps uh, due to the, the way we build uh, our cities and, and, and sort of uh, uh, plan out our green spaces as well as the amount of people that actually have to go and, uh, and had to essentially essential workers that still kept working and, and commuting to work during the pandemic uh, sort of shut down days. Uh, so that is definitely reflected here in, in the map. Um, you see sort of a lot of low or cool spots, uh, which in this case mean not necessarily that uh, it's low incidence of any one particular uh, hazard, uh, rather that the combination of the two uh, is not a, a particularly high. Uh, and you see that close to, to the southeast uh, coast, uh, mainly due because they're relatively cool areas because of the sea breeze that I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, and, and, and that's sort of reflected in the map as well. Um, so, so yeah, so a, a lot of the work that we're doing sort of uh, uh, highlights uh, where these overlaps of, uh, of, two, of the two hazards, heat and COVID-19 are, are significantly high. Um, and, and where they overlap with, with high social vulnerability areas, uh, like I just uh, showed, um, which essentially show, leads to these sort of hotspots where we really have to be careful how we deal uh, or how we plan the response. Uh, remember the, the, the sort of example of the cooling centers that I mentioned earlier. Um, and, and then we're going to extend this work to, to other weather related hazards as well. Uh, we have flooding that can be significant in different parts of the city. Um, as, as well as uh, uh, different types of uh, infrastructure failure uh, that we have been reported. And we can sort of combine these uh, to get a better sense of how to respond to, to sort of these overlapping hazards. Uh, so yeah, so very happy to answer questions uh, coming up. And uh, thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Ortiz, for sharing with us your work. So next up, let's welcome Dr. Jeffrey Townsend from Yale University. You're on mute, Dr. Townsend. Thanks for, um, for uh, tuning in for this. I'm gonna talk today about the durability of immunity following infection by SARS-CoV-2. And this is a collaboration uh, led by me with a bunch of members of my lab and some other folks who have uh, worked on it with me who are all listed here. So, uh, Start from the beginning, the durability of immunity upon natural infection has been called by many the greatest unknown factor of the COVID-19 epidemic. Uh, just to give you some examples of this, uh, on the left, you see a nature video talking about uh, the, uh, the big questions six months on, uh, the major one of which that they highlighted was what is the durability of immunity once you get infected? Uh, secondly, on the right is a news article from STAT uh, seven months later, what we know about COVID-19 and the pressing questions that remain. And in there, you'll find that one of the ones they highlight to the greatest degree is what is the durability of immunity 
of COVID-19. Now, most of the studies that have uh, spoken about this topic have done longitudinal longitudinal observation, uh, looking at the decline of some kind of antibody response uh, after infection by SARS-CoV-2. The difficulty with doing that on SARS-CoV-2 and getting a result is that uh, the decline of antibody uh, of antibody level occurs uh, fairly slowly. Um, and as you can see in this, one of the first papers that came out, uh, essentially there's not much decline here. There's just the increase consequent to infection uh, in these three different IgG types, and then sort of a leveling off. And in a few individuals, there's a little bit of decline, but really on average, you're not seeing the decline yet. And that's characteristic uh, actually of all coronaviruses that they tend to decli start declining around 90 days. Um, and that's already three months in advance. In a short epidemic like this, there's just not enough information to figure out what the decline of antibodies is and what its correlation with uh, immunity is. So that news um, that in fact, uh, you know, uh, that in fact uh, antibodies may decline uh, sparked some fears that immunity to COVID-19 wanes fast. Um, this is just a, a news article saying studies show coronavirus antibodies may fade fast, raising questions about vaccines. And then, uh, but you can find answers sort of both ways. So many have deemed the question impossible to address. This epidemic is so recent, there have been few well-monitored reinfections. Um, so here on the left, you see one saying, my patient caught COVID-19 twice, so so long to herd immunity. You know, is, is there no immunity that you get from this disease? And then another article uh, simultaneously or very nearly simultaneously, can you get COVID-19 again? It's very unlikely, experts say. So it would be really great to answer this question. And I'm here to say we can answer this question. On the contrary, there's not nothing known, but we do know something about the durability of immunity to SARS-CoV-2. And the reason we know it is because of the historical contingencies of evolutionary biology. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 is a coronavirus like multiple other coronaviruses that are listed here, SARS-CoV-1, the, the three, the, the human coronaviruses you may be familiar with that are cause the common cold regularly. MERS is another example. Uh, and those coronaviruses all have uh, genetic differences that tell us how closely related they are to each other. So we can learn something from the other coronaviruses about SARS-CoV-2. And there's a very rigorous way of doing that, and that is by phylogenetic analysis. So if we look at the different viruses, we can see how closely related they are. And the fact is that viruses can't evolve super quickly. They have limits to the rate at which they can evolve and how fast they can change. And we have methods in evolutionary biology to understand how fast they change across a phylogenetic tree, such as this one, which we reconstructed from the genome sequences. So uh, the kind of data that we want to take into account to the, do this is to look at continuous, is to, we want to do continuous ancestral and descendant state inference under a Brownian motion model of trait evolution. And the kind of data we're looking at is this anti-N which is one of the genes of, coronavir of the coronavirus, IgG, which is just an antibody type um, across time. So this paper by Edridge et al, uh, very fortunately looked at the three, uh, I'm gonna talk about three of the seasonal coronaviruses here over time and examined when they had peaks, these starry points, which indicate that there was an infection in an individual. Uh, uh, these are in the seasonal coronaviruses. And then that allows us both to understand what levels of antibody allow an individual to get infected, but also how long it takes for them to decline between uh, times of being infected. So analyzing both of those things across the uh, coronaviruses, and I'm sorry, this appears um, much more pixelated on the screen than it uh, did when I made it, but uh, we're able to actually characterize the peak normalized antibody levels over time based on that kind of data for these human coronaviruses. We're also able to characterize the daily probability of infection or how long over, over time it takes, how likely are you to be infected as your antibody level declines. Uh, this is for these seasonal coronaviruses for which that longitudinal data over many, many years, that was over decades, was collected. Now, in addition to understanding this about the seasonal coronaviruses, they're embedded in this phylogenetic tree that it allows us, enables us to also study the seasonal coronaviruses for which we don't have daily probability of infection data, but for which we do have some data on the, on the um, IgG, IgA, IgM, on this uh, information about the antibody level. So combining that data uh, based on what we already know about SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-1, MERS-CoV, and these three seasonal coronaviruses, combined with the information on daily probability of infection, we're able to use phylogenetic methods to impute what the daily probability is of infection and what the rest of the 
uh, antibody to Klein is probably like for each of these uh, um, zoonotic coronaviruses, enabling us to estimate the time of waning of immunity, the probability of infection over time, and the probability density of reinfection. So what this gives us is this probability of density of reinfection over time. This is an axis of days on the axis here. And you can see that although there's some differences between the antibody decline and the daily probabilities of infection among these different diseases, the overall distribution of when you get in of, of a time of reinfection does not appear to be all that different between these different diseases. Consequently, what we can conclude um, uh, in our main analysis is the following, that the median time to reinfection by SARS-CoV-2 appears to be about one year, seven months. Uh, SARS-CoV-1 is quite longer. Uh, SARS-CoV-2, by our best estimate, SARS-CoV-2, again, one year, seven months. MERS, one year, four months. Although it's never been, uh, you know, you don't get reinfections because the zoonotic disease does not spread from human to human. And for the different uh, seasonal coronaviruses, we get somewhere between four to six years for the duration of that. So what are my conclusions? They are that this ancestral and descendant states estimate of the timing of the waning of immunity can facilitate a quantitative analysis of all policy decision-making with regard to individuals who've recovered from COVID-19 and who may be viewed as immune to reinfection but may not be after some time. Uh, secondly, the durability of immunity, of immunity has implications for the deployment of recovered healthcare workers, of travel restrictions, decisions on how students obtain their education, uh, prospective vaccination protocols for clinical trials, as well as the opening and closing of economic sectors in response to predictive models of the epidemic. Uh, our estimate strong, uh, argues strongly against the claim that a long-standing resolution of the epidemic could arise due to any kind of herd immunity from natural infection. Such a strategy jeopardizes millions of lives, entailing high rates of infection, morbidity, and death every 1.5 years. It provides some guidance as to the likely timescale of immunity conferred by a typical vaccine. I'll have a caveat about that in a moment. Uh, this approach has general applicability to rapid prediction of parameters for any novel pathogens, provided they're embedded in a clade containing three or more previously studied human pathogens. Uh, I just wanna give you a few caveats to make sure it's clear what we can and can't say from this. The research addressed durability of immunity in response to typical natural infections under endemic conditions. Uh, the durability in response to vaccination requires a little further analysis because vaccination doesn't give you the same antibody level response that uh, natural infection does necessarily. Uh, and also we're under pandemic conditions until the world's population has been exposed to the disease or vaccination. And so uh, that means that some of the timings are gonna be slightly different for some complicated epidemiological re reasons. Uh, our estimate and some certainty should be understood as a prediction of the average durability, not universal to everybody. Uh, we know that different antibody levels are sparked by different infection levels and by different vaccines. So uh, each individual is slightly different. This is what's typical. And because SARS-CoV-2 is a novel virus to the human immune system, the reinfection may not exhibit the same severity as first infections we will have to see as time goes on. Thanks very much for the time and from the support from NSF to do this very interesting research. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Well, very interesting and exciting findings. Um, and everyone, please enter any questions for Dr. Johnson into the chat. And again, we'll have that extended Q&A at the end. Great, so next up we have Dr. Gongli Wang uh, from Georgia State University who, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, uh, so next up, we have Dr. Gongli Wang from Georgia State University. Um, he couldn't be with us in person today because of a last minute conflict, but um, a, the postdoctoral researcher on the project, Jonathan Pelford, is with us today to answer any of your questions um, in the chat or in the ending Q&A. So Dr. Wang has recorded his presentation, which I will present now. Oh, and I don't know if the audio is working this time. Should okay. I try? It's okay. Let me do, let me just redo this really quickly. Okay. Thank you for letting me know. I was just going to push on. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I want to start by thanking CIC for offering this amazing platform, you know, for ours from very different fields to share the, our progress and our research uh, on this common theme 
motivated by the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is a product supported by chemistry, OSF chemistry, chemical measurement, and the imaging. So we are relatively late. We started around June or July uh, to work on this project because at the beginning, I thought the existing tools and PCR-based uh, method, which is a lab analysis technology, would be more than adequate to offer a good uh, uh, yes and no answer to uh, for this qualitative uh, testing needs. So it was not until um, all the false, false, false and false negative results being reported of all those tools being used uh, under emergency use authorization, we realized there are fundamental things we can contribute. So our goal is to develop a method that can be further developed into a tool that it need to be highly accurate. In the meanwhile, it need to be low cost, easy to operate, and offer results quick, instead of taking multiple steps and you know from how whatever sample you take, many steps down the road, you get a readout. We really want to simplify this procedure to speed up the process. Researchers have been working on developing better tools for analysis, basically nonstop way before this pandemic hit us. So there are fundamental reasons why these are very, such a challenging task. Uh, for this specific, specific product, the ultimate sensitivity we want to, we need or we can achieve will be detecting a single virus. And we really want the detection to be specific. The most specific to the virus would be the generic material. In this case, it's RNA sequences specific to the uh, virus, right? So fundamentally, there are problems to achieve this kind of a goal. One is the signal associated with single molecules. They are generally very, very, very weak. And because every measurement, there is noise associated with it. And it can be random noise, meaning there's nothing we can control of. And there can be sampling errors, especially when we are handling the samples with very low quantity of the target. Of course, there will be human mistakes and more or less it's going to occur, especially when you handle the sample multiple times, like what happens down here. So to avoid, uh, to overcome the signal to noise limitations, all the our currently adopted tools are almost exclusively based on sample amplification. These include lab tools like PCR and the, almost all the fast testing tools that, that I'm aware of. Right, so you just need it to amplify, grow the signal sample more so that the signal is strong enough to be measured. So what we decided to do is we want to tackle the problem from another, another angle is called some signal amplification. So instead of grow the samples, we try to improve or amplify the signal. So this is the core of the method or concept. Hopefully my explanation makes sense. So you look at this uh, faucet and remember water flows through when you switch this one on. So that's the principle we operate when we design this uh, tool. What you are seeing is down here is an electrode. We can read the signal out. And there are DNA aptamers in here folded in a way that uh, this molecule is far away from the electrode. So there's no signal. You, you do not see a signal. Now, in this loop structure, there's a segment that is in perfect complementary to the specific RA sequences, and in this case, the SARS-CoV-2. Right. So when this RA is present in the sample, it's going to bind to this thermodynamically favorable, and then it's going to unfold it so that you know, after the unfolding, this molecule is going to be close enough to the electrical surface that turns the signal on. So this is a principle that has been used for many years, and here are the credits to the earlier work. But the signal associated with the single probe is not strong enough for us to read the signal out directly. And if you only have one or a handful of variety in it, that's just not going to give you enough signal. So our contribution is to introduce this redox cycling mechanism is basically when this molecule is undergoing electron transfer reactions. In the meantime, there are some secondary reactions going on in the solution. So you can turn this molecule back 
So that is this molecule works as a tunnel or mediator. So it allows the signal to go from all of this here to through here. So it's almost like you are using the VRI as a handle to switch the signal on and then water flow and that gives you the signal. And in case you are interested, uh, here are what, how the, what the data looks like. I'm going to skip all the details on how to read them and understand them. This is actually from the earlier work when we work on microRNAs. So these are published. Basically, you see a quantitative correlation uh, from the measured signal to the sample of target concentrations. In different zones, there are different uh, correlation profiles that allows you to do a quantitation. And here are the results we have so far. We already pushed the detection limit down to atom molar. This is 10 to minus 18. And that translates into a few thousand molecules in a few minutes. And then remember, we amplify the signal directly. So this is a one-step detection. You can actually directly read the signal out down to this level. And there are rooms to improve. We are actually having some success to push it down to zipto molar concentration range. Or we are seeing signals from uh, tens or hundreds of molecules uh, in tens of minutes. Okay, so that's uh, being wrapped up, and hopefully we will be ready to report that uh, uh, soon. This is a fundamental product that generally takes uh, many years to develop. So, although this one-year project is approaching an end, we surely will continue to work on this uh, direction because the method and this uh, technology can be quite versatile to tackle other type of virus or microRNAs. Um, so currently we are trying to improve the results through modern assimilation and experimentally we need to establish parameters to work on to be ready for, to tackle real life samples. And this is a prototype device we made in house. And obviously we cannot make a million of them. Um, so we need to, or someone need to figure out the engineering aspect for mass production. But at least uh, the benchmark, benchmark number you saw in the last page, I would say that's pretty impressive. That's way beyond my in, initial expectations. So uh, these are not trivial and very technical challenging products. I need to give credit to my uh, team and my collaborator, Dr. Kumar. And this is Jonathan, he is a PhD with me, currently he's working with, as a postdoc. And Sarah just started, she will be working on some modeling and simulations and Mei Jun worked on this project at the beginning and then he took an offer um, that she cannot resist. Again, I want to thank uh, NSF Chemical Environment Imaging uh, for the support of this uh, product and thank you for your attention. Very interesting research by Dr. Wang and his team. And if you have any questions, please drop them through Dr. Paddleford in the chat. Great. So next up, we have Dr. Haichong Kai Zhang from Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Thank you, Helen, for introduction. And hello, everyone. Um, it was very um, um, great pleasure for me to have an opportunity to speak um, in this webinar series. And uh, my name is Haitong Zan. I'm assistant professor in um, biomedical engineering and robotics uh, from Ursula Park Institute. Today, I'm going to be talking about uh, a little bit different flavor from other talk. Probably it's more engineering focus from engineering and robotics perspective, how we can contribute toward uh, the, the challenge we're facing with COVID-19. And before I start, I would like to acknowledge all the team and collaborator um, where we have a multi-disciplinary uh, institutional or even multi-continental collaborator um, from United States and Nigeria and Japan, um, where we have BIDMC and CPHS, as well as uh, African University of Science and Technology uh, National Hospital of Abuja from, from Nigeria. And, and I also appreciate the support from NIH to allow us to do this research in a, in a timely Matter and uh, like to give a special credit to Dr. Ryosuke Tamura. He led this project and um, basically built this robot um, from scratch once we realized the need during this pandemic. Okay, let me start from uh, why we are doing this kind of project and, and why robot you know were necessary toward COVID nineteen. I need to start from 
um, describing uh, why we need to have those imaging devices at the first place. As we already know that COVID-19 is already providing significant impact. And at the same time, we, the good news is we already know that there's a lot of like effective way to detect COVID-19, including the previous presentation um, being, being prevent, presented. Um, what, what PCR or antibody provide us is the qualitative information, how much, you know, uh, if we are uh, infected with COVID-19 or, or not. Then the next thing what patients want to know when they go to hospital is how much this virus is affecting the patient's lung and how urgent the treatment they should receive. Uh, if the patient should go to ICU right away or the patient should be isolated or should be seroquarantine. Uh, which require more detailed analysis understanding the situation of the patient's lung where diagnostic, in, uh, diagnostic imaging will play a critical role such as uh, x-ray imaging, computer tomography, CT, uh, what which sound has been widely used in hospital in the United States or around the world. Um, the limitation of those diagnostic imaging currently we identify is the fact that x-ray or, or CT are affect the imaging device. We can see the you know, picture of the lung, but accessibility for such device um, is limited um, given the fact that uh, we need to bring the patient to those machine room, which is cumbersome and has a risk of transmission. And also we need to sterilize the machine um, every single usage between different patients. And, and more importantly, for the resource limited environment, including African country that we're working with, um, the, the accessibility for those devices itself is, is not trivial. Therefore, we need to find a way to provide more cost-effective and um, effective diagnostic imaging to wider population around the world. This is where we're focusing on lung ultrasound, which is currently used um, diagnostic uh, imaging approach for COVID-19 which do have a high sensitivity to pneumonia. Actually, um, it, is also, it is actually more sensitive than x-ray and it's extremely low cost because of the presence of point of care ultrasound system emerging these days and with no radiation and it's quite portable. This is why we thought about ultrasound can be you know, a good alternative and effective solution to diagnose patient status of the lung. Then here's some example how lung ultrasound is being performed on a patient is following the established uh, clinical workflow where they have to scan um, in total 10 regions, like five regions for each side of the lung, including anterior, lateral, and posterior side of the lung. And typical sign of COVID-19 in lung ultrasound, including those like a straight line up here uh, toward that direction, which is known as a patchy B line, as well as pleural uh, sickening, the, the change of the, um, uh, parallel line uh, as well as uh, some sub parallel uh, consolidation or there's other signature that we can observe from COVID-19 patients. Then we know that lung ultrasound is gonna be effective. Then why we still need to have robotics here? Um, fundamental challenge of current lung ultrasound to be used for COVID-19 is a limitation that there's a limited accessibility toward the the operator who can perform lung ultrasound effectively. And, and ultrasound is the procedure where you can see from the picture require the operator to physically interact with the patient. They need to hold the ultrasound probe and you know, touch the region to region to get a required information for them to diagnose this. Therefore, it's highly user dependent or operator dependent. Therefore, to have accurate diagnosis, you need to have someone who is well trained which is not that widely available, unfortunately, um, in this current situation. And, and more importantly, you may notice that um, the, the fact that the physician and uh, sonographer uh, and the patient need to interact physically, which also impose huge risk of transmission, uh, which we want to solve. So what we want to propose in, in this project here is we are making a, a robotic solution to allow lung ultrasound procedure can be performed in a least resource limited environment does not impose um, huge costs compared to X-ray or CT. At the same time, minimize the risk of transmission because we don't, we're making a robotic system which eliminate the need that the doctor need to sitting right next to the patient anymore. And, and this system is, uh, is structured like a gun tree where it's designed to be able to scan all the region where 
which is required to perform diagnostic uh, imaging of, of lung uh, ultrasound procedure. And, and the, this robot is consisted by several components, including the mechanical part, which can allow to scan from the top and from the sides, uh, side, as well as some safety measure uh, we call it as a passive end effector, where this robot is only allowed to apply certain amount of force, which is not exceeding the limit. In other words, we mechanically make this system to be safe, not going to damage uh, and providing any harm on the patient which is related to one of the work that uh, Dr. Tsumura, uh, the postdoctoral fellow uh, on this study, um, performed a similar project for prenatal imaging uh, undergo with a human study for validation. And here is actual demonstration of the system. Um, you can see the robot can scan and move around different region of the body where um, it's currently showing um, the anterior region where we have a uh, three camera which capture the patient body from the top and from the side and where ultrasound image can be provided in real time, can be recorded, can be transferred that information to the doctor for them for uh, diagnosis and or evaluation. The, 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 the robot arm can move um, from the side, uh, can provide the lateral view and uh, when patient uh, flips side of the body, they can also scan um, the back side of the body, which will cover whole region where required to do COVID-19 diagnosis. And, and we also asked the um, uh, emergency physician to evaluate the score of the image collected by the robot compared to the image we acquire from manual scan. We can see that the score, which is evaluated by doctor, bas basically um, um, scoring the image, um, image quality, where we can see that the comparable image quality can be acquired with the robot compared to manual scan uh, without using the robot system. So where, we, we, where our robot is right now, we, we started this project 2020 um, April, and we, we start design from scratch and we made a robot. And now the robot is transferred to Nigeria and, and hopefully this robot will be able to um, testing on actual patient subject there. Um, we are very excited about this initiative. Um, lastly, I would like to appreciate all the collaborators who support the project as well as the funding source from NIH to, to allow us to develop this new engineering technology. Um, thank you very much for attention and let me know if you have any question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Zhang. This is so innovative and it's really exciting to see your robot already being tested and soon to be used. Great, so last up we have Dr. Caroline Zeiss from Yale University. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. Um, I'm going to follow on a previous talk, namely how long does how long does protection last after you've been exposed to COVID either naturally um, or via vaccination? And to study that, we looked at an animal model. Uh, we didn't look at antibody levels, but we did look at the amount of shedding and the capacity for that shedding, shed virus, to reinfect naive animals. So we used a native rat virus called STAV. Um, this is a, a rat-specific beta coronavirus that is very closely related to the seasonal human coronaviruses we get. Um, its next closest neighbor is MERS, and then the next one after that is SARS-2. And it causes a relatively mild interstitial pneumonia that is transient. The animal recovers in 10 to 14 days. So it's not a great model of lung injury. However, it is a good model of transmission because all of the essential features of SARS-CoV-2 transmission are replicated in this virus. So we used SDAV to model transmission of SARS-CoV-2. We also used another rat coronavirus, also quite closely related, to model vaccination. And so the analogy here would be a live viral vaccination. Our intent for creating this data is then to put it all into an SEIRS model, which is a mathematical model, to um, model epidemic to endemic transition which is what we're doing now. All I'm going to present today is the in vivo data. So these, this is how we modeled initial exposure to STAV. Um, the, the capacity to generate an immune response is dependent not only on the individual, um, but on the mode of exposure. So the higher the viral exposure, generally the better the immune response. So we wanted to model high risk and low risk exposures. We started off with inoculating rats with known amounts of virus and then exposed those to recipient rats via a couple of routes. The first was via direct contact. 
Um, and then our low risk exposures were fomite exposures. One was a fomite cohabitation model, where after the fomite exposure, the recipients are co-housed. So if one got it, it could give it to another via direct route. And in the other, they were singly housed. And that was our lowest risk exposure. Um, so we see that when we separate all of these recipients out, uh, these are our positive controls throughout. So these are animals that are inoculated that are red. We see that their PCR positivity rate, so these animals were swabbed five, for five days sequentially after exposure. Um, their, their PCR positivity rate is 100%. So um, pretty much similar between direct inoculation and direct contact, and they all seroconverted. And then as we go down to our lower risk exposures, their PCR rates go down and so do their seropositive rates go down. Um, just to note the, the CQ, this is the cycle number, low is more. Um, so this is the threshold at which you detect the virus. And we see that with direct inoculation and direct exposure, we're looking at around 28 to 29 cycles. And then the shed amount of shed virus is much lower with the lower risk exposures, which is what we expect to see. We also notice that shedding exceeds conversion. So the virus can replicate in the nose and be shed and be detected as a positive test, but it doesn't penetrate the body enough to actually induce seroconversion. And the point of that is that even though you test positive to extrapolate to COVID, it doesn't mean you've developed immunity to the virus. This is what happens after a break of three and a half to four and a half months. Um, after the initial exposure, we have two populations. We have seronegative rats that never seroconverted and seropositive rats. In the seronegative group, when we expose them with the same paradigm, we see very much the same results. So that's driven by the risk of exposure. And in our seropositive group, we see that even those animals that are seropositive, that have seen the virus, that their immune systems have responded, a fair number of those, overall close to 60%, will share the virus and re-exposure. And the group to look at is this group here, red. So these are animals that got SDAV intra intranasally and then got the same dose intranasally again. So they got the highest exposure, highest immunity, and then highest re-exposure. And even those animals still shed at about 40%. However, the cycle times are much higher, which means that the amount of virus shed is much lower. Next, we looked at we, whether these animals that were shedding, immune animals, shedding virus at low amounts could actually give the virus to naive animals. Um, this is what we see on natural exposure. So these are our animals that got one dose of SDAV intranasally, waited three and a half to four and a half months, got a second dose, and then co-housed them with naive animals. And almost a quarter of those animals, those naive animals, shed the virus and seroconverted. With vaccination, um, we vaccinated animals. Now we waited a shorter amount of time. So that's analogous to what's happening now. We exposed, exposed those animals to naive animals. We up the bar. So we expose them for seven days. And we see that we only see 14% um, of infections. So and, and at that point, the seropositivity is much lower. So it means that they're shedding very low amounts of the virus that can transmit to animals, but at a very low rate. It's tempting to think vaccination is better and it's certainly more consistent, it's more controllable. Um, however, we should also note that the time between vaccination and exposure is much shorter here. Whereas in the top with the natural exposure paradigm, it's a little bit longer. So this really models what is happening currently but you have people that were exposed by natural infection and their immunity is probably waning at this point um, compared to people who are being vaccinated currently. So to conclude uh, with natural exposure and re-exposure, I think every piece of data produced by scientists that tells us that herd immunity via natural exposure is not a good way to go. Again, this is one more piece of data to say that. Natural exposure gives you very heterogeneous immunity and on re-exposure, the risk of shedding is high across the diversity of immunity that you see with natural exposure. And that amount of shedding can cause transmission to a naive person. With vaccination, greater protection in the short term, 
um, but it is likely that that protection is also going to wane over time. So overall, it, I would say it looks likely that this disease is here to stay um, and probably requires revaccination on a regular basis. Currently, what we're doing is applying this data to our SEIRS model, where we're going to introduce the notion of respiratory infection as well. Uh, with the that's a sort of low to high risk. The, the entire spectrum is is housed within respiratory infection. So I'd like to stop there um, and thank the NSF for funding this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Zeiss. It's so interesting to see so much diverse research, but also some overlapping findings um, and all very relevant work as we continue to work towards reopening and, and vaccines and everything like that. So great, thank you again to all the researchers who presented today. All of their talks will be available individually at covidinfocommons.net um, under the Meet the Researchers tab. Um, before, so it's now 501, so I'm sure people are dropping off. I'd like to quickly mention um, that we, I'd like to announce our line up for our next webinar, which will be held on Friday, July 16th from 1 to 2 p.m. Um, the event page is now available on the events um, tab of the COVID Information Commons website. And great. So now I'd like to open it up for just general Q&A. And, and then of course, these are ways that you can continue to stay involved with the COVID Information Commons, um, get news about events and um, opportunities as well. So if there are any questions, anyone who's remaining on the line, Please feel free to unmute. Dr. Zhang, I'd like to ask a question um, about your work. So when I was uh, thinking about how, you know, you had it, the, the device here and now it's in uh, Africa and you have partners in Japan, there's so much opportunity for transition to practice <laughs> um, and actually creating this device and making it available. So um, do you already have plans like that or are you looking to maybe go for like an NSF SBIR, NIH SBIR uh, proposal or something like that. Do you have um, plans to transition to practice? That, that's a very good point. Uh, what I was thinking, uh, so there are a lot of party involved and I think each of the embodiment has their own mission and our group is also making a variety of robot to um, supporting seminar mission, let's say for, for Lang Uchisyang. and. This particular robot that we build is very intent to make a early adaptation and present the feasibility of those if those robots can really provide impact to the patient or you know to the African country or those community where they need to have imaging solution. So if we can su successfully demonstrate that those imaging device is useful, then the second or third generation robot that our our group is building in the U.S. right now can potentially be, you know, the second round of like second iteration to be um, applied to other uh, area and country as well, where commercialization can happen, not necessarily with the first generation, but from the second or third generation. I think what we are trying right now is kind of like a power approach. The, the first generation we try with a like a low risk approach, which is similar to the similar robot that used for other application before. Then in, in, in background, we're also making the new generation, which is more optimized for lung uh, ultrasound procedure and or more like more commercially realistic one. Hopefully that will follow up and also we'll be able to uh, hopefully can, can share exciting results sometime soon. That's wonderful. You have a number of potential channels to bring that to fruition. So I think that's great. Uh, absolutely. Any other questions before I ask another one? I love all this research. So Dr. Townsend, Dr. Zeiss, you both uh, talked about um, um, immunization, vaccination, how long are you, you know, are you safe? And I think a number of us are believing that um, this will be an annual type of vaccine potentially. Um, you know, we're thinking about there'll be a booster. Um, it was interesting looking at the different time frames. And so do you have any thoughts on when a booster may be needed? You know, it, I think I saw something around a year or a year and five months or seven months. And then, you know, I've been thinking about it's going to be like the flu shot. Like, you know, I've even heard that uh, it could be every fall or something. And I've even heard that there are some of the pharmaceutical companies, I think, considering combining the COVID and the flu vaccine so that 
it's like once and done, you get it once a year. So do you have any opinions on how that might roll out? I know there's a range of uncertainty, but I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Um, sure, I, I could start with that. I think the variants are a wild card. Mm -hmm. You know, with, with the rat study, the, uh, the exposures are actually, I think, more intimate that, than occurs in the general population. So I think there is a higher likelihood of transmission that we see in the rat study that we would have to account for in a model. Um, but the variants, who knows, you know. Yeah, who knows is the right answer, but um, I figured you guys might know better. <laughs> well, I, um, I, would, I would say that, um, you know, your speculation is probably, you know, right on the money as far as our best estimate goes, uh, because it is certainly true that, you know, the, the relationship that, that I talked about between the antibody levels and the probability of infection is, uh, although it is plausibly causal, it is also plausibly phenomenological, meaning that, and in fact, there's some data to indicate that it may be phenomenological, meaning that like the level that you drop your antibodies to is also corresponding to the amount of evolution that the viruses actually are ongoing, are, are experiencing ongoing. There's, there's evidence that SARS-CoV-2 is not any different from the human cold, you know, the HCOV viruses in terms of all these variants that we've seen. Like we followed them in detail in SARS-CoV-2 because this has become a national obsession because of the enormous impact it has. But the common cold varies with genetic change over time as well in very similar ways and the very similar plate way in this on the spike protein. So um, there's not there's a lot of evidence that these are very, very similar viruses in there in terms of just their overall way of of um, of of making their presence known to us, so to speak. So I, I think that that's about right. I mean, I mean, you know, maybe a little bit longer, maybe a little bit shorter. One caveat that I would say to that, you know, because the estimate is 1.5 years or so. There's also some very weak evidence because again, in a pandemic, it's really hard to know regarding the seasonality of this virus. It seems very seasonal. We've got a lot of, it, of sort of ancillary evidence saying it is, but we can't really na nail that down when we've got a pandemic with lots of interventions going on. So all of that comes together to say, it seems like I would say probably around a yearly vaccination booster would be about right. Now there's one caveat that I just want to say, which is that vaccine, the vaccines really are not the same thing as experiencing a natural infection in a variety of different ways. But the one maybe possibly hopeful note is that in order to generate these uh, uh, mRNA vaccines, for instance, they actually have to stabilize that spike protein in certain ways. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not clear whether that stabilization is something that has an effect on how your immune system actually recognizes the spike protein or not. But mm -hmm. From what we've seen so far, it seems to help that recognition process. And it may be that having a more stabilized spike protein means that you get antibodies that are gonna have a longer duration of immunity against um, variants as they evolve than normally would be seen. On the other hand, we've already seen some degradation of the immunity uh, in some of the variants that are coming now. And a lot of that degradation is not selected de degradation. It's just coming from random changes because it's em emerging in places where there wasn't necessarily a lot of vaccination. Yeah, it's kind of a volatile situation. One more follow-up question. Um, does anyone else have a question? I see something in the chat. Oh, there's a, oh. Dr. Zeiss has a question from Dr. Townsend. Yeah, just trying to figure out how to answer them. The technology, I mean. Um, actually, I could just read the question. That might be simpler. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate on why the, uh, the virus that we used for vaccination represents a better model for vaccination than would be natural infection by the first virus exposed the rats to? Um, so the analogy is, is using cowpox to vaccinate for smallpox. So they're similar viruses and there's cross protective immunity. The RCV, the, the, the immunity that it gives is slightly less than if you were to give the natural virus. Um, this is not identical to vaccination. So we don't have a vaccine for SDAV. Such a thing does not exist. And we couldn't really use the vaccine for SARS-2 because the viruses are not similar enough. So this was essentially the closest thing that we could get to a vaccine. And I think the results would be very similar to giving the natural infection to SDAV. 
they would be very similar, although RCV has got a slightly less, um, it's going to have slightly less protection. Very interesting. Did you have a follow up question, Dr. Townsend? Or? No, I understand. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to ask a question, another one. Um, so when they first came to us, uh, NSF, and said, you know, we'd like you to do this rapid on a, a COVID information commons, I actually started Googling, you know, coronavirus and looking for background and stuff. And at the time I found um, an NSF award, which I can't find anymore, which was for the third biennial coronavirus workshop in 1985. And then I went a little deeper <laughs> and I found um, some documentation from Springer. Um, and I just put it into the chat. So there's coronavirus history um, information from Springer and Nature. You know, we all we all abide by them. We all play with them. I publish with them. A lot of us probably do. And um, interestingly, if you go through it, you can find papers from like the 1960s, right? And we know that the coronaviruses were first discovered back then. I think by a woman in the UK, perhaps. So, what is it we we think we may have learned if we actually paid attention all those years. Is there, is there something that maybe um, would help us looking back or do you think we just have to look forward? Well, I have one maybe anecdotal thing to say, which is that one of the more interesting papers that I read was a paper by Callow, which I can't remember the data, but it goes way, way, way back. Uh, and that paper did do some experiment, they did some challenge exper experiments, which are unusual and not often done, uh, but they had some interesting results uh, about this question about the variance versus the antibody decline. And the interesting result was that there were instances where they did, and I can't recall exactly how they did the perfect controlled test, but I remember reading it and believing it was pretty well controlled, uh, where they looked at whether or not if you took an original, it took someone who was exposed to a virus and then two years later exposed them to exactly the same virus, uh, and whether you took them, uh, you know, exposed them to a virus and then took a virus that was circulating two years later and exposed it to them to see which one would infect the person. And mm -hmm. only the one that circulated for two years infected the person at all. They could not get the old virus to which that person had been exposed two years ago to infect the person and cause some symptoms. So it just goes to show you that I think that, that goes along with my sort of anecdotal argument that that, the, that the, the generation of these new variants, the evolution of the viruses themselves is a lot of what we're dealing with in terms of the antibody, the waning of antibodies and not so much uh, just a too low antibody level. Uh, nonetheless, I don't think that contradicts the kind of results we can get using those antibodies as a metric for how long you've sort of been, how long you were exposed to that. It's certainly true that having more antibodies is gonna help you in defense against a pathogen that's attacking you. So, um, so the, the two are mixed in an interesting way that needs further work. I agree. So I think that would be an interesting paper. I was actually hoping that with the kick student paper challenge, one of the students would do that, but I think it would be interesting to look back and see what we may learn from the past. Uh, other research that's been done while we're trying to plan the future. Any other comments, or questions today? Well, thank you all for being here. Thank you for the great presentations. Thank you for sticking with us. Um, in our next meeting, actually, we are going to have one of our Kick Student Paper Challenge winners presenting, um, which is really exciting. Uh, and so we'll be posting those papers on the Kick website, and then we're also going to be adding them to the Columbia Academic Commons. So for the undergraduates that actually participated in one. Uh, so we're very excited about that. So we hope you can join us. And Hel Helen, anything else? No, thank you again to everyone, um, all the speakers today and everyone who's joining us. Um, and we hope you continue to stay engaged with the kit. Thank you, everyone. Be well. Great. Stay thank safe. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a great evening.